Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I'm your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this podcast and all the other podcasts by going to porkinspolicyreview.wordpress.com. Well, for today's episode, I thought we could focus on something that is just being discussed ad nauseum in both the mainstream and the alternative media, and that would be the Winter Olympics, which are taking place in Sochi, Russia this year. And I thought we could discuss some of the the big sort of talking points that are, as I said, are being discussed uh, just incessantly by both the mainstream and the alternative media. And uh, to start with, I think we could focus on something that is just sort of inescapable and is certainly getting the most sort of uh, press right now. And that are the the so-called anti-gay laws in Russia. Now, uh, just uh, you know, full disclosure, I don't agree with these laws at all. I think that they're obviously stupid and asinine. And uh, this podcast is not designed to be some sort of pro-Russia, pro-Putin propaganda piece. Um, but like with uh, our previous episode on the Dalai Lama, I think it's important to really dissect what's actually going on here. And to put it into the, the greater context of uh, geopolitics and uh, things of that nature as well. So let's, uh, let's dive into these, uh, what are being dubbed anti-gay laws in Russia. And uh, this is something which, of course, the mainstream media here in the U.S. loves to pick apart. Um, You know, they'll just go on and on and on about it. Obviously, if you uh, can bear to watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox, anything like that, this is just uh, constantly brought up over and over again. And uh, I uh, found it a bit odd that people weren't really um, digging into this. You know, they weren't really uh, trying to understand what, in fact, this law was and and how it actually worked. And this term anti-gay law is just sort of bandied about as if that is truly what the bill is. And and as I said, uh, I'm not in favor of this, but I still wanted to understand this a little bit better. And I was uh, searching online for some, you know, sort of critical analysis of this. And I discovered a really excellent policy paper that was written by a man named Brian M. Heiss. Now, uh, Brian wrote a paper called the Russian Federation Anti-Gay Laws and Analysis and Deconstruction. And in this, he breaks down what's actually in the law, how it's really being implemented, and sort of compares this to the United States, where he is from. Now, uh, Brian M. Heiss is not a right-wing uh, Christian conservative. This is not like the Family Values Council or, or any of those sort of groups. Uh, Brian is openly gay. He is an expert in diversity and inclusion. He has authored several major research papers uh, discussing uh, these sort of matters, and he's even served as the Strategic Council of Chief Diversity for several major Fortune 500 companies. So this is not a man who has some sort of axe to grind against uh, gay people. But this law, as I said, is perceived here as... uh, being anti-gay and anti-lesbian and and so forth, and it certainly is to a major degree. But uh, the idea that people um, who who are gay in Russia are being rounded up and carted off to concentration camps and they're being murdered in the streets is a bit overblown. And for me, at least, I I see the reality of this law as really an anti-free speech, as it what it really does is criminalizes the, quote, promotion of non-traditional sexual relations. Uh, so, you know, this isn't necessarily, uh, the, the law itself is not saying that you, it's illegal to be gay in Russia, which of course is what the mainstream media here is uh, portraying the law as. What it's really doing is um, discriminating against people who want to openly talk about this. Now, uh, just a, a couple important notes just on that, nowhere in the law are the terms gay, lesbian, homosexual, transgender, uh, queer, anything like that. They're never used at all. Uh, instead, it it's, you know, specifically focuses on the promotion of non-traditional sexual relations. So I think that's an important thing to note because nowhere in this law is it saying, oh, you know, no, no gay speech, no this or that. Um, now, what 
uh, Brian does in this is he, as I said, breaks it down. He goes through the law and he also lists a, a couple of really important factors. And I think we'll just sort of try and focus on the main ones. The paper is fairly long, but I would really encourage the listeners to go through it. He includes the actual text of the law, which is something that I'm absolutely positive no one in the mainstream media and most of the consumers of mainstream media that get um, you know, brainwashed by these people have actually read. And I think it's important to, to truly read the law. But he also you know, provides lots of information. It's all excellently cited. So it's very important. But he uh, breaks down the sort of uh, genesis of this law. And as, uh, as, as of 2013, there were a total of 10 regions in Russia which passed laws similar to this, banning propaganda, quote-unquote, whatever that really means, regarding the promotion of non-traditional sexual relationships. Now, the first of these was in the Ryazan Oblast region, and that was in 2006. Now, uh, important to note again is that there was little, if absolutely no, coverage whatsoever on this. So as with any sort of big media story like this, especially one involving uh, you know, the big bad boogeyman that is Russia, it's important to note the timing of this. We've got the Olympics going on. We've got the uh, crisis in Syria, which Russia is, is fairly involved with as well. So the fact that all of a sudden the people are waking up to the fact that several regions in Russia have been doing this is, is interesting in and of itself. Now, in the past seven years, from 2006 to 2013, when these regional laws were in place, uh, one would think that, oh, well, of course, they must have been, as I said, you know, rounding them up, beating them, killing them in the streets, and there must have been lots of, you know, people arrested and jailed for this. But as uh, Brian Heiss points out, in these seven years, in all ten regions, there have only been a total of six prosecutions, and of those six prosecutions, only two convictions. And one of these convictions, which is fairly important, was overturned. And this was seen as a big sort of blow to the nationwide law that Putin signed most recently. Just some core facts here regarding Russia and the U.S. in terms of LGBT rights, which Brian Heiss lays out. And these are important because, again, the, the perception is that Russia is this violent place uh, for people who are gay. And no doubt, let me just state again, Russia is not some sort of gay paradise. I would not encourage anyone to go there uh, who, who is uh, openly gay and wants to really, you know, talk about it. I think it is uh, slightly dangerous. Uh, but as I said, I think it's important to uh, contrast this with the United States because, of course, the U.S. is really pushing uh, this this agenda that we are, that we you know here in the United States we are some sort of gay paradise, which is not really quite true. But just some core facts from Brian Heiss's article or paper rather here. Now, uh, the decriminalization of homosexuality in Russia. This was signed into a national law in 1993, and this essentially stated that it was not a crime to be gay. Um, now, obviously, I don't think that uh, anyone needs a, a law written to say that it's, it's, I mean, you know, what does that mean? A piece of paper written by a bunch of rich men, mostly, uh, that, that, you know, they don't need to give you any sort of justification that it's okay to be gay. I mean, there's, no one can really uh, say that at, that at all. But anyway, as I said, Russia signed this law in 1993. Now, the U.S. didn't sign any sort of law like that until 2003 in a Supreme Court case known as Lawrence v. Texas. Now, still, though, there are 12 states in the United States which have these uh, so-called anti-sodomy laws, which essentially criminalize people engaging in uh, gay sex. Now, uh, this, <laughs> again, is probably fairly shocking. This is not being reported whatsoever that there are 12 states where this goes on. And as early as 2009, two men were kicked out of a restaurant in El Paso for simply kissing in public. They were told to leave. Now, they were obviously uh, upset by this. They went to the police and you know, wanted some sort of form of restitution. And the police officers there said that, uh, we, well, we could just cite you for, quote, homosexual conduct. 
just 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 for kissing in public. This, <laughs> now this uh, was later dropped, um, and the police chief in El Paso said that these guys were were new to the job. They didn't really know what they were talking about, and they obviously didn't want to uh, make this into a big deal. And they said that the the so-called anti-sodomy laws in El Paso only regards to quote deviant sexual intercourse with another individual of the same sex. So just again, important to to put this into context. While we're bashing Russia for doing all these horrible things, there are 12 states in the United States where you can be arrested uh, for or at least kicked out for kissing in public. Now, can you be fired from a job in Russia due to your sexual orientation? No. There, again, is a national law which prohibits any sort of discrimination against somebody. Now, in the U.S., uh, it happens quite frequently that people are dismissed from their job for their sexual orientation. There is no sort of national protection. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should have some sort of national law. I think that we should obviously do away with all of these stupid laws, and you don't need some bunch of uh, old farts in the Supreme Court to say, oh, it's, it's totally okay, you know, your lifestyle is all right, we accept it now. Uh, no one has that right, and uh, you, don't need, you don't really need to listen to them. But yes, this happens all the time, and, uh, you know, as, as a sort of personal example, um, a, a very good professor of my sister's was expelled from the college that she worked at, uh, simply because she was a lesbian and she was open about it and she incorporated much of that into her artwork. So this does happen quite a bit and again it is not reported whatsoever. Now uh, Russia, uh, uh, in terms of military service, Russia in 2003 Putin signed a law uh, basically stating that no one in the military could be fired or could be discriminated against or not allowed to join because of their sexual orientation. Again, the United States a little bit late on this, and that only happened in 2011 uh, with the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But again, a little, another uh, little important note here is that it is still illegal to engage in gay sex in the military. So you can join the military and you can go and you can murder uh, innocent people in foreign countries, but you can't actually engage in gay sex. And important to note right there is that if you read the, the actual law, and this is again quoted in Brian Heiss's article, they equate sex between a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, and bestiality in the law yeah, under military... Uh, their military service conduct, whatever the hell it is. So, you know, quite troubling and quite uh, offensive in that. Now, in terms of adoption, um, Russia does not allow gay couples to adopt. Uh, now, the U.S., that varies from state to state. So, uh, you know, um, and, and again, this isn't sort of a, you know, one point for Russia, one point for the for America. This is just sort of stating some of the, the clear facts, which, of course, get... Um, missed in most of the discussion here. Now, uh, a really interesting one is giving blood. Now, Russia signed a law in 2008 that said that, you know, anyone who gay or lesbian, transgender, whatever, they're allowed to give blood. Now, since 1983, the United States has not allowed anyone who is gay to give blood. And uh, if you've ever gone to a blood drive or anything like that, you're, you have to sign out this, this uh, fill out this uh, long paper, and on it, it asks, have you engaged in gay sex at any time since 1977? And if you mark yes, then you are not allowed to give blood. So again, very interesting. In terms of marriage, Russia does not allow gay marriage, and in the United States, this varies from state to state. Uh, now, a, a truly interesting one are transgender rights. Now, Russia signed in a nationwide bill in 1997, uh, which essentially protected anyone who was transgender. And within this law, you have things such as uh, document changes. So if you are a man and you become a woman, you can then have your diploma, you can have your driver's license, you can have your birth certificate changed to reflect that. Now, in the United States, again, this varies widely from state to state with some states allowing document changes and some not allowing anything. So again, uh, interesting to note. Now, I think the most important aspect that um, of these sort of 
bullet points right here that Heist focuses on is the idea of hate crimes, because again, we have this perception in Russia that it's sort of a free-for-all that we've got, you know, these marauding gangs of um, homophobes going around and killing people. Now, according to the Russian Sofa Center for Information and Analysis, which is probably the most widely respected human rights organization in Russia, and just to prove that this isn't some sort of uh, Kremlin-controlled group, they were uh, founded with the help of George Soros and the Open Society Foundation. They, uh, Some of their big sponsors are the National Endowment for Democracy, Freedom House, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the State Department, and lots and lots of others. Woodrow Wilson Center for Diplomacy. So this is not a fringe group. This is not a Russian Kremlin-controlled organization. This is the, the you know a mainstream group that is supported by the likes of George Soros and the neocons at Freedom House. Now, according to the Sova Center, between 2010 and 2013, there were 40 incidents of hate crimes. Now, let's compare this with the FBI, which is uh, regarded as the best uh, resource for hate crime. Uh, statistics. From 2010 to 2013, there were 4,476 incidents of hate crimes. Now, these hate crimes are, again, these are hate crimes directed against uh, gays, lesbians, transgender people. So, again, quite a startling difference. Of course, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow or any of the other talking heads on the various mainstream media, Wolf Blitzer, these people are not uh, focusing on that statistic whatsoever. They're again just saying, oh, you know, Russia, that is uh, the Nazis have come to power and they're rounding up all the gays and then soon it'll be the Jews and, you know, it'll they'll completely implode. Now, according to Sova, again, there was, uh, from 2010 to 2013, there was only one person killed uh, because of a, a gay hate crime. Now, this is versus 25 people in 2012 alone, uh, according to the FBI. So, again, quite a bit of a discrepancy uh, between what we are being told and what the reality is. Now, I uh, don't want to offend people, and I don't want people to think that uh, this, that, you know, I'm, I'm working for the Kremlin or that Putin is paying me. Obviously, I'm not. But uh, I just think that it's really important to actually understand what's going on and to, to maybe understand why there is this big push um, against Russia right now. Now, the, the largest sort of um, blaring contradiction here is this very, very noble stance that uh, our government has taken against these anti-gay laws. Now, there are 76 countries in the Americas, Oceania, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East where being gay is completely illegal. If you're convicted of being gay, in any of these 76 countries, you can receive a punishment from uh, a mere fine to uh, public beatings and whippings uh, up to uh, stoning. You can be killed for being gay. Uh, and this is, you know, of course, in, in Saudi Arabia, one of our great allies. And speaking of these great allies, of these 76 countries, 10 of them are key, key U.S. allies. And that is Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Kenya, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, as I said, Singapore, Uganda, India, the United Arab Emirates, Yemen, and Qatar. And Qatar is a very interesting one because we are about to host, or Qatar rather, is about to host the 2022 World Cup in their country. And this is a country where, you know, it it's not even that the, quote, promotion of non- uh, traditional uh, sexual relationships is illegal. It is simply illegal to be gay. Now, I have not seen any of the mainstream media touching on this at all. We're, you know, they're going to host a huge, huge sporting event with people from all over the world, and you cannot be gay in this country. Now, nowhere uh, is the New York Times or NPR or any of the, you know, crap media touching on this whatsoever. So I think that's really interesting. And uh, so when, when you hear Obama go on to Jay Leno and, and say this... Well, something that shocked me about Russia, and I, I'm surprised this is not a huge story, suddenly homosexuality is against the law. 
I mean, this seems like Germany. Let's round up the Jews, let's round up the gays, let's round up the black. I mean, it starts with that. You round up people who you don't want. I mean, I'm, why is not more of the world outraged at this? Well, uh, I've been very clear that when it comes to universal rights, when it comes to people's basic freedoms, uh, that whether you are discriminating on the basis of race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation, uh, you are violating uh, you know, the, the basic morality that I think uh, should transcend every country. And I have no patience for uh, countries that um, uh, try to treat gays or lesbians or transgender persons in, in, uh, in ways that uh, intimidate them or are harmful to them. Now, what's happening in uh, uh, Russia is not unique. When I traveled to Africa, uh, th there were some countries that are doing a lot of good things for their people you know, who were working with and helping on uh, development issues, but in some cases have uh, persecuted gays sure. and lesbians. And it makes for some uncomfortable press conferences sometimes. But one of the things that I think is very important for me to speak out on is making sure that you know, people are treated fairly and justly uh, because that's what we stand for, and I believe that that's uh, a precept that's not unique to America. That's something that uh, should apply everywhere. What he's doing is completely lying to you. He is gaslighting you. He is telling you that, oh, well, I, you know, totally, totally uh, disagree with all of this and any anyone's rights who are abused is completely wrong. Well, at the same time, he supports Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Kenya, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Uganda, all of these countries. He, he has no problem. And you see him there, he sort of throws in, oh, it's... You know, it's, it's really uncomfortable at a press conference when I'm, I'm standing next to uh, Museveni in Uganda and he, you know, his parliament is passing the kill the gays bill, as it was dubbed. But Obama doesn't really go out of his way to condemn this, you know, and, and then again, he throws in the, well, they're, they're doing great things. These dictators who we've put in place all over Africa to act as basically our, uh, you know, the colonial overlords for us, but, you know, we can't physically be there all the time, uh, but they're doing some really great things. You know, they're really, really stepping it up. So, uh, you know, he's, as I say, he's just lying. He's gaslighting you. He's, he's convincing you that what he says in public is what he, you know, really actually means um, in reality. And that's not true whatsoever. So I, I guess that sort of brings us to the end of this topic, and I just want to sort of talk briefly about the, the reasons for this, why I, why I chose this as a thing, because obviously I think we've, we've heard this uh, over and over and over again, and I just want to state again, this isn't, I'm not against uh, people who are gay, I, uh, you know, at all, I, I, and I, I don't really think that the listeners are really going to, to take, take that away. But I think it's important to understand this. We've got Syria's role, uh, Russia, excuse me, Russia's role in Syria is uh, very geopolitically sensitive right now. And um, they're obviously, uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, Putin really actually helped create peace. I think, again, that is a, a, a misnomer. And we hear that a lot in the alternative media that Putin is a statesman and that he's, you know, I think he's a brilliant chess player on the geopolitical chessboard, but, uh, you know, what he did in Syria was really a face-saving thing, and obviously, again, you know, Putin is uh, an authoritarian leader. Um, I think it's pretty clear at this point, if you've been listening to the podcast, I, I don't believe in any form of leadership or government or any of these things. Um, there, there is only natural law. There is only yourself. Only you can decide uh, how you want to live your life, and you know you shouldn't really listen to to any of these things. So, i.e., this law in Russia is is nonsense. It, it's not. Uh, it, it has no validity whatsoever. But again, there is this. There, there's always this constant anti-Russian sort of Cold War rhetoric that goes on, and it takes many different forms. And right now. Obviously, the easiest one is to paint Putin as this uh, homophobe, which I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that he he probably is. I mean, uh, as I said, this is not a nice guy. I mean, he he butchers people, he does these horrible things. But essentially, you know, this is this is really about 
trying to weaken Russia on the world stage, because obviously Russia is exerting itself and is um, acting as a sort of counterbalance to American imperialism. Now, that's not to say that Russia doesn't have imperial interests in mind. Uh, but lastly, a really important uh, point that Brian Heiss brings up in his article, uh, which is something that I, I had no idea about, is the sort of showbiz Hollywood angle of much of this uh, anti-Russia bashing. Now, Russia has become one of the major consumers of uh, Hollywood media, and they are slowly outpacing even China, and this is according to a Disney executive vice president. Now, with this law in place right now, if uh, a broadcaster, let's say like Viacom, which has a big stake in Russia, if they were to promote non-traditional sexual relationships on TV or in movies, they could receive a 90-day ban. Now, a 90-day ban might not seem like a lot, but to a company such as Viacom, that is a huge amount of money that is disappearing from them. So when you hear this, all of this rhetoric, know that this isn't really about protecting gay rights, because clearly we don't really protect them here in America. This is about ensuring that the Hollywood execs, who of course donate a tremendous amount of money to Obama and to all politicians, that their interests are not affected by this. They don't really give two shits about the average gay or lesbian or transgender person who is uh, being discriminated against in Russia. And you can look no further than the, the despicable Hollywood portrayals of gay people here in America. What they are really concerned about is, you know, are we going to lose a billion dollars out of this? So really important. Keep that in mind. And just, uh, you know, as I always say on the podcast, you got to look deeper. You've got to look at the big picture when you're talking about issues like this, because many times you're being you're being manipulated. You are being uh, you're being brainwashed into believing something, and that that's very dangerous. Now, I think we've we've sort of exhausted that for right now. So let's move on to the other big, uh, the big thing, the big boogeyman that is in the background of the Sochi Olympics, and that is oh terrorism, Islamic terrorists. This is again the uh, probably the second biggest sort of news story that is constantly being drilled into our minds that there is going to be some sort of terror attack in Sochi. Lately, uh, there were these idiotic reports from the Department of Homeland Security that groups of terrorists were planning on smuggling uh, explosives in toothpaste tubes and that they were either going to construct them on the plane and try and blow them up or then construct them in the airport. And of course, uh, once this was issued, the mainstream media wet itself with excitement and started blasting that, you know, through newspapers and TV and radio. And uh, <laughs> barely anywhere in this is the fact that Russia has a universal ban on all liquids, paste, gels, anything like that, entering into Russian airports for the Olympics. So the idea that somehow a group of Islamic terrorists could get all of this toothpaste in, and again, I mean, you'd I don't know for certain, but I'm assuming that you would probably need quite a bit of toothpaste to really make a, a serious bomb here. Uh, that's just not going to happen. They're not going to go in there. And in fact, the security at the Olympics is, is probably the most terrifying and draconian of any other Olympics. And I'll include a really great post up on Cyberspace War, uh, which is James Evan Pilato's, one of his uh, websites. And this was uh, posted by Brock West. And it basically just breaks down some of the, the latest security updates for Sochi. And they talk about the Ring of Steel, which is this thing that Putin uh, kept talking about. And this is basically this Ring of Steel, as he calls it, around the whole Olympic village. And, you know, there are there is a camouflaged military base just outside of the Olympic village. There are tens of thousands of police and military uh, patrolling everywhere patting people down, you know, going uh, just pretty, pretty kind of scary stuff, actually. There is a 24-hour drone surveillance program, so they've got drones flying all over Sochi. Uh, they just rounded up 
some horrific amount of dogs and executed all of them because they were so afraid that someone was going to poison a dog or put a bomb in a dog or and send that into the stadium. So Russia is taking this quite seriously. And anyone who knows anything about Russia and about their sort of uh, uh, terrorism protocols, they're, they're pretty serious. I mean, they'll, Putin is, is uh, the, the butcher of Grozny. I mean, he will murder as many people as he can to uh, stop the, the terrorists. Now, I think it's really important to note that the only actual real credible threat of terrorism comes from Saudi Arabia, that wonderful country which uh, cuts people's heads off for being gay. Now, this threat, uh, people might not uh, remember this uh, because it happened quite a while ago, and unless you're really focusing on the alternative media, you're not going to hear this anywhere else. But Bandar Bush, who has reappeared again as the Saudi intelligence chief after possibly uh, disappearing or dying, as was reported for a while, he popped back up again, and he's, uh, of course, extremely involved in Syria in funding many of the al-Qaeda jihadist elements there. And he visited Russia, I think, believe it was a couple times, and was trying to persuade Putin to sort of back down on Syria and let Saudi Arabia essentially go in and create a sort of client state, which, of course, would be subservient to the United States. Now, he offered... A $15 billion weapons contract to Russia. He even offered to give Russia a controlling stake of the world's oil market if Russia backed off Syria. So again, folks, we're going back to Syria. A lot of this has to do with Syria. Now, Putin uh, said, I, I don't want any of this. Uh, clearly, we, I mean, Russia has a very large controlling stake of oil and natural gas. They've got enough weapons. They don't need a $15 billion contract from Saudi Arabia. Now, when this happened, uh, I believe it was first reported in Al Monitor, and I'll, of course, all the links will, will be provided here. But according to a leaked uh, document, that, that, or the leaked minutes, uh, from this meeting between Bandar Bush, Bandar bin Sultan, and Vladimir Putin, uh, Bandar Bush is alleged to have said, I can give you a guarantee to protect the Winter Olympics in the city of Sochi on the Black Sea next year. The Chechen groups that threaten the security of the games are controlled by us, and they will not move in the Syria's territory direction without coordinating with us. These groups do not scare us. We use them in the face of the Syrian regime, but they will have no role or influence in Syria's political future. So essentially saying that we control the Chechens and we will make the Olympics a real bitch for you if uh, you don't go along with us. And I believe that we, we touched upon this in an earlier podcast as well. Now, of course, Putin said, uh, oh, thank you so much uh, for coming. We know that you support the Chechen terrorists and you've done this for decades. And uh, we're not really afraid of you. And we'll deal with the Chechens our own way. Now, uh... Before you, you jump to, oh, this is just a conspiracy theory, this is just who knows what this what was really going on in this uh, sort of private meeting between the two of them, what followed a few months after that, of course, were the Volograd bombings, which are just a, a couple hundred miles away from Sochi. It's in the Dagestan region, which is this very volatile region. These happened, uh, I believe, in about late September, and we'll have... Uh, you know, in the show notes, we'll have some articles on this, but there were a bunch of huge bombings. We've also got the Chechen rebel leader Umarov giving these, you know, very terrifying warnings about Sochi. And let's put two and two together here. It's, it's not that crazy to think that this uh, could happen. So that's the real credible threat here. Not that some crazy suicide bomber is going to come in who is just a, you know, a rabid jihadist. No, the real threat is that Saudi Arabia, the United States, their terrorists, who we have funded for decades, will go in and disrupt the Olympics. Now, of course, um, you know, we've been bashing a lot on the mainstream media here, which is quite easy, but the alternative media, of course, ran with this and just went hog wild with this story. And it became this whole false flag, false flag. And you, you hear that uttered uh, over and over and over again. And of course, we can look at the, the London Olympics and lots of different media hosts. We're not going to name them all here. We're talking about, oh, this is going to be the biggest false flag event. There's going to be some major terrorist attack. And of course, absolutely nothing happened. 
And for me, I think that this whole terrorism threat, in my opinion, is complete uh, hype and, and paranoia. It's just not going to happen for the very fact that, I mean, you could not get into the city of Sochi to commit something like this. It is so locked down at this point. And f uh, furthermore, of course, Putin l sort of loves these kind of things because then that, that lets him just go and do whatever the hell he wants. Oh, well, you know, yeah, the, the threat of terrorism, it, it's very real. So I need to now go out and uh, kill all of these terrorists. And, you know, if the, some innocent people get mixed up, well, you know, they, they probably shouldn't have been living near the terrorists anyway. So uh, <laughs> the, the terrorism threat is, is just is overblown. And the real threat is actually coming from places like Saudi Arabia and the United States. You know, we fund these people. We control them. So, as I said, this whole threat of terrorism is 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 hype. It's it's meant to make everyone terrified. Uh, no doubt, there's going to be some you know new crazy gadget or new terror protocol that's going to come out and make a lot of money for some people. And you know, it just feeds into this whole narrative that there's this, this terror, terror, terror. And of course, then there was you know the, the yesterday during the or right before the Olympic ceremony, there was this weird story that appeared about a Turkish man who alleged to have a bomb on the plane and wanted to divert the plane to Sochi. And I, I don't, I didn't really know what to make of this story. Uh, it seemed a little bit far fetched. He didn't have a bomb. Uh, Turkey is being fairly quiet about this, uh, but again, important to note, you know, where is this coming from? It's coming from Turkey, which is where many of these Chechens go to hide. And again, you know, the Chechen terrorists are, they live in Turkey, they live in Germany, they live in the United Kingdom, all NATO countries, again, all, you know, basically client states of America. So important to keep that in, in mind when you're talking about this terrorism threat. Now, I guess let's move on to the last issue here, which involves Ukraine. Now, I'm assuming everyone is, is pretty up to date on the turmoil in Ukraine. I'll provide a, a couple art, good articles on this. But we've got this uh, ongoing conflict in Ukraine right now, which again is being painted here in the West as, you know, the, the, the good... Uh, people of Ukraine are trying to throw off the shackles of Russian imperialism and just become part of the EU. You know, they just want to be, you know, part of the European Union, as if anyone would actually want to join the EU right now. I mean, it's economically idiotic. And more to the point, what this is really about is getting Ukraine to become a NATO member, or at least some sort of honorary member and have NATO bases there. And if you read through the draft text of the EU proposal that is being you know, given to the, the the Ukrainians, I mean, that that is just, there is a whole section on the fact that basically Ukraine will become a, a new NATO country. And again, once again, encircling Russia. Now, this is not to say that Russia, you know, obviously Russia has a great interest in Ukraine uh, in terms of the trade deals that they have there, but it's not quite the uh, story that we're hearing he here in the mainstream media. Now, the U.S. maintains that Russia is working behind the scenes and trying to manipulate the situation, and they are, you know, of course, the, ooh, the nefarious Russians. And while simultaneously uh, condemning anyone as a conspiracy theorist who voices the opinion that, well, perhaps uh, America is working behind the scenes. I mean, that just, that doesn't happen. No, no, no. You know, of course, uh, the U.S. government supports these uh, protesters, but we're not actually really manipulating anything. This, of course, while we've got George Soros's NGOs and lots of other uh, Western NGOs in there uh, who have a, a very uh, shady past, and we, we touched upon this uh, in the Egypt episode and the influence that these NGOs have there, you know, and you've got uh, psychos like John McCain going and visiting with... Uh, declared neo-Nazis in Ukraine, which, uh, again, that, that is part of this opposition movement, are these far-right uh, Nazi parties. You're not, you're not really hearing that on uh, CNN. But again, you know, as I said, this is all uh, seen as just Russia meddling. Now, uh, a few days ago, there was a uh, 
a clip of a conversation between Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland and the ambassador to Ukraine, U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt. Now, no one knows where this uh, came from. It is certainly a uh, conver- phone conversation between the two of them, and this was recorded somehow and then was released to the press. So uh, let, let's listen to this clip first, and then we'll, we can discuss uh, what's actually going on here. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. Um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I I guess you think in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, the three-plus-one conversation or three-plus-two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, – Klitschko has been the top dog. He's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got, and he's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. I uh, can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the U.N. guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the U.N. help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And, again, the fact that this is out there right now, I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych did that. But in the meantime, there's a Party of Regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we can probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. Hmm, well, there you have it. Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt essentially talking about how they're going to form the new government in Ukraine. Uh, they... 
very openly talking about who they want, how they're going to do it. Uh, they they even talk about getting some, you know, a UN official to kind of officiate this, make this look all perfect. Uh, where when in reality, I mean, they're they're the, they're behind the scenes picking who they're gonna have. Let's have Klitschko out here because he's not ready. Let's have you know the Yanukovych over there, whatever. Uh, they're completely manipulating the whole situation. And of course, uh, what did the the news media run with was uh, Victoria Newland saying "fuck the EU." She had to then apologize for it, and Angela Merkel got all upset about this, and oh, it's so wrong. And, and that's what you're gonna hear when you talk about uh, when you when if you listen to this in the mainstream media, not the fact that they're literally just plotting regime change. They're plotting how they're going to form the government. You know, nowhere in there is the mention of the Ukrainian people, what they want to do. Instead, it's two people on the ground in Ukraine. Victoria Newland is there, and as well as Jeffrey Pyatt, basically talking about how they're going to form a new government. And if you if you don't think that they're going to be completely controlled and subservient to the United States, that you're insane. Uh, quick little note, Victoria Newland is a big neocon. She was a advisor to Dick Cheney. She also married Robert Kagan, who's another one of these psycho neocons, and is also, important to note, a former ambass- U.S. ambassador to NATO. So again, this uh, you know her, her big push to make Ukraine uh, a NATO state, this is not a coincidence at all. I'll play just a quick little clip from a, a press conference that happened after this uh, back in Washington with uh, Jen Psaki, who is the State Department spokesperson, and she was getting really grilled on this. I'm just going to play a quick one just to kind of give you a brief overview of what was going on there, but I would encourage you to listen to the whole thing because it's pretty wonderful because she just keeps walking into this dead end and using all of these kind of verbal gymnastics to kind of explain away what was uh, really being said in this conversation. The Russians have repeatedly accused the United States government of interfering in Ukraine's politics. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government has to some degree made reciprocal claims about Russia. Um, Does not the fact that U.S. diplomats uh, purportedly are discussing who should and should not be in a Ukrainian government uh, hint at some possibility of U.S. interference here? Absolutely not. Uh, It should be no surprise that U.S. officials talk about issues around the world. Of course we do. That's what you do. That's what diplomats do and discuss, especially issues where we've been closely engaged. You know, the secretary met with the opposition this weekend. He stopped by a meeting with the foreign minister. Uh, It's up to the people of Ukraine, including officials from both sides, to determine the path forward. But it shouldn't be a surprise that there are discussions about events on the ground. This was more than discussions, though. This was two top U.S. officials Mm -hmm. that are on the ground discussing a plan that they have to broker a future government and bringing officials from the U.N. to kind of seal the deal. This is more than the U.S. trying to um, make suggestions. This is the U.S. midwifing the process. Well, Elise, you're talking about a private diplomatic conversation. Those happen all the time. Of course, as part of private diplomatic conversations, there are discussions about what involvement the U.N. can have, what involvement or engagement should happen on the ground. That shouldn't be a surprise. Of course, these things are being discussed. It doesn't change the fact that it's up to the people on the ground. It is up to the uh, people of Ukraine to determine what the path forward is. Oh, okay. It's just it's just up to the, the Ukrainian people to decide uh, between uh, the hand-picked United States orchestrated leader. That's all it is. You know, of course, yeah, it's up to the Ukrainian people. Uh, we're, we're not meddling whatsoever to, obviously, despite if you listen to that phone conversation, I mean, that's all that they're doing is meddling. And uh, also, I just love the way uh, Jen Psaki there talks about, but this is a private conversation. And if you listen to the whole clip, she keeps going back to that. Of course, it's okay to bug virtually everyone around the world and listen to their private conversations as long as the NSA is doing it. But you know, when the Russians uh, do it to us and then leak it out, that, that's really rude. You know, it's a private conversation between diplomats. 
And uh, as I said, listen to that whole clip because it's really hilarious, just the, the way she keeps, and she gets so upset about the constant questions. And that, that uh, reporter that you hear uh, right at the beginning, she eventually just said, I'm not, li- I'm not talking to you anymore, something like that. But, um, well, we've been talking now for a little while, and I guess we should start wrapping this up. And I just want to state again that the, the objective of this podcast is not to paint Russia as a, a gay paradise, as a, a, you know, a wonderful country. Clearly, um, it, it is a brutal state, and uh, you know, furthermore, I mean, it is a, a state which uh, really has no validity whatsoever. But all I want to do is that when, you know, when you're watching the olympics this year if you watch them when you're if you're reading about all this stuff keep it in mind you know there there is a lot more going on behind the scenes a lot of this really has to do with the geopolitical things such as ukraine such as russia's role in syria this is also about protecting of course as many times it always is corporate interests be it hollywood in 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 russia uh you know be it uh, these major corporations that are, are operating there gas and oil there's always a lot more behind the scenes it's not just uh Putin bad, America good. Obviously, they're both despicable, uh, horrible leaders, Putin and Obama, or wh- whoever really their puppet masters truly are, which are Putin and Obama are not really the, the, the real leaders of uh, their respective countries. Of course, there are many more people on you know at the top above them. Just keep that in mind. And uh, if you uh, listened to the opening ceremony with uh, Imperial mouthpiece David Remnick from The New Yorker, I don't even know why he is, you know, is invited to go comment on this. Of course, you know, all you hear from him during the opening ceremony is, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, Russia, quite brutal, autocratic. Uh, you know, he, he mentions the word imperial about every three seconds, talking about their, their previous imperial empire without ever... Uh, noting the fact that America is truly the largest imperial power right now all over the globe with military bases everywhere, uh, complete control over countries' uh, economies and finance and banking. So keep all of that in mind. Uh, Obviously, enjoy the Olympics. A little uh, full disclosure, I really like the Winter Olympics, to be honest, Um, and uh, I I do watch the opening ceremony. But uh, you have to keep that in context. You, you have to really dig a little bit deeper because there's a lot more going on there. And, uh, you know, so especially the next time you hear someone going on and on about uh, the, the, the anti-gay laws or about the terrorism or about the turmoil in Ukraine, maybe, maybe point them towards this podcast. Point them towards some of the show notes. Ask them, do you really know what's truly going on here? So with that, I think we'll leave it there. You've been listening, of course, to Porkins Policy Radio. I'm your host, Pierce Redmond, and uh, I just want to give a quick thanks to all of the listeners. Uh, we've had a lot more listeners lately, and that's really fantastic. It, it means a lot to me to, to see the, the stats going up on the, on the website, on the YouTube channel. And if you like this work, then please visit PorkinsPolicyReview.wordpress.com. Follow me through the RSS feed. You can follow through uh, email blast updates. Um, of course, always on Twitter, at PorkinsPolicy. Go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash 1138porkins, and you can subscribe to me through there. But the biggest thing is really, you know, if you like this podcast, then just tell a friend about it. Email it to someone. Put it on your, your, your social media. Uh, tell, tell a friend, as I said. We've had some really excellent uh, numbers going up. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all of the fans in Sweden who have been listening to this. I'm not really sure who you guys are. But I would love to hear from you if uh, you want to send me an email. Perhaps we could set something up. We could have you on the show at some point and just talk about uh, alternative media and maybe perhaps the state of Sweden, what's going on there. And uh, with that, I think uh, we'll leave it there, and I will talk to you very, very soon. Thank you.